So uh, hello everyone. I just want to welcome you all to this uh, lecture series on uh, human flourishing in a technological world. Just the briefest background. Um, this is part of a three-year project. It's the sort of the final, uh, the final year where we um, put our findings out uh, for some feedback from people. So this whole lecture series is by members of this three-year research project, an interdisciplinary research project on human flourishing and technology. The lectures are somewhat thematically staggered. So today we have the pleasure of hearing Dr. Robert Doty from Trinity Western University, who, whose lecture is a kind of an overview, historical, uh, conceptual overview of how we got to the kind of theological matrix, the house that we inhabit uh, today, along with the language and metaphors that, that bend our thinking and our ways of seeing in a certain way. Um, that will be then followed uh, by a lecture on the patristic spectrum and uh, you know, pointers from the patristic era, the early church fathers on, on this kind of thing. And then so on, we will go through certain topics uh, around that, uh, the, the theme of human flourishing in a technological world. So I'm really glad you're all here. College. Uh, we so I forgot to say, I'm, I'm Jens Zimmerman. I'm the project director of this uh, three-year research project that we had. I'm the uh, J.I. Packer Chair of Theology at Regent College, affiliated with the University of British Columbia. And today our first speaker in the series is Dr. Robert Doty. Again, I refer you to our project webpage, human flourishing, sorry, christianflourishing.com. Christianflourishing.com should be in the chat function, the address. If you want a full um, rollout of the, uh, uh, of the project and of the different members and their bio, we're not going to waste uh, Dr. Dodi's time with a long introduction. Um, he is uh, professor of theology at, uh, sorry, professor of philosophy. I should not get these things wrong. Professor of philosophy at Trinity Western University and um, has published on the theme of technology, transhumanism uh, and epistemology of technology and so on. Um, and uh, he has spent a lot of time and I've profited greatly from his wisdom on technology human anthropology and how technology changes and impacts our thinking about what it means to be human. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Dodi, welcome. Thank you for providing this lecture for us and I will give you the floor. All right, yeah. Living souls to software selves, the movements of enchantment through Western metaphysics. This is kind of like my, my, Meta narrative of of Western thinking um, through the trope of uh, enchantment disenchantment. It's just a way of organizing um, various uh, outlooks uh, in the history of Western civilization with a, a constant reference to uh, enchantment. And I'll talk about what I mean by that. Um, so we're on the road to mind upload. Um, where does this all begin? Uh, where do we get the conceptual resources to think about ourselves as susceptible to um, being copied into uh, some informational database and carry on our, our lives, if you want to call them that, our consciousness, our, our uh, cognition in uh, a substrate of, well, silicon at this point, who knows what it's going to be. How did we get there? That, that was my, my question. My task was, to identify key metaphysical shifts in Western thought that served, let me just move you guys here a little bit, sorry about that, uh, so I can read my own notes, that served to make the notion of mind upload plausible in late modern Western thought. So it's a big sweep I'm going through. I'm going to go through it quickly, selectively distorting every way uh, possible. Um, but uh, giving like 
what I think a like, relatively strong read of how we how we got here. So a few things to clear up before we get rolling here. What is mind upload to, such that we might be interested in its rise to plausibility? Some of you may not be familiar with this notion. Um, it has taken on, you know, it's been out there in science fiction for decades upon decades, but it's, it's garnered respectable scientific academic credentials um, in the, the past maybe two, three decades. It's basically the idea, and I'm not gonna dig into all the variations of scenario on this. It's basically just the idea that um, you are your informational patterns, sometimes referred to uh, pattern identity uh, theory. That, um, what is your essence? Isn't your flesh? Isn't your body? Isn't your relationships? It is the patterns of information uh, instantiated in your neurophysiology. And if we can just copy that information and leave behind the substrate, the, the fleshly love, love straight substrate um, we can capture you and and put you into uh, other substrates that are more durable more lasting and uh, more uh, capacious in in terms of uh, giving uh, room for all kinds of enhancements, enlargements of capacity um, and uh, duration. You, you could, in a sense, move towards a kind of immortality once you're freed from the degrade, biodegradable body that we're all kind of you know, uh, shackled to, this mortal disintegrating coil. So oh, very brief and, and uh, kind of superficial account of brain or mind upload. I don't want to get into the details because that's really not part of uh, what I'm, I'm doing here. But you can see that this is uh, something that would capture the attention of you know, late modern consumerists. Um, and it has really... Um, had an impact on uh, Western civilization in the past decade or so, where lots of money is being invested in uh, technologies aimed uh, to accomplish this that might be spent elsewhere, social programs, educational programs, uh, DARPA, the, the U.S. military um, uh, agency, um, part, part of the Department of Defense, you know, they have like a massive budget for developing technologies that will produce, um, you know, the superior soldier. And, and so a lot of money has gone into uh, this kind of uh, research and development in, in the defense industry. So whoever gets that superior soldier that can, you know, stay at high levels of alert and um, functionality with, you know, uh, eight hours of sleep per week, um, you know, that army is going to be uh, one of the most powerful forces when it's coupled to uh, the advancing hardware technologies uh, in the war theater. So anyways, that's uh, a brief introduction to what I'm doing. Now I wanna give you really um, uh, an, 
overview of uh, where I'm going um, by talking about uh, the living souls of the pre-modern Western cosmos, um, the many uh, views of what ultimate reality uh, consists of, um, right from the, the early uh, pre-Socratic Greeks, even before them, uh, to the more animistic outlooks, um, right up to the present. Um, from the beginning of history, the, the dominant experience of the real scholars has, have inferred has been animistic. Um, the experience of the world uh, as alive, uh, where there's the, not really this big disjunction between what I'm experiencing and what's out there. We uh, haven't quite gotten that uh, divide in place in our early, more primitive experiences of the world. And so the world is experienced as, as living, as an extension of me or as I'm absorbed up in it. The I barely ever, you know, even looms large in, in this. The cosmos were enchanted, eternally pulsating with their own vital, divine, and intrinsic energies. Uh, you know, rocks would fall um, because they desired to, to get home you know, back to the earth. Uh, fire would rise because it wanted to get back up to the sun, which, which was home. Um, there was no real death in this world. This is something uh, Hans Jonas uh, deals with uh, quite uh, insightfully, I think, in his book, The Phenomenon of Life. Um, just how there was an ontology of life in these pre-modern um, experiences of reality. We get to Thales, uh, a pre-Socratic philosopher, famous for uh, saying that all things are full of the gods. They're alive and uh, they have their own vital energies of movement and intention. All kinds of Greek words uh, in the uh, Greek philosophers carry this sense. You know, nisus, uh, physis, uh, entelechi, pneuma, nous, logos. These were all words that were applied to what we would today call the physical world. And it was because that world was understood to be alive. And I'm saying enchanted, right? So let me give you just a brief uh, preview of enchantment's migration. It starts out robustly here in, in the pre-modern experience of the world, right? Intrinsically given in everything. You know, this is the pantheism, the animism of this uh, early experience of the world, which gives way to an intrinsically uh, given enchantment in some things. Uh, this is polytheism in the sense where, you know, there, it's not that everything is uh, alive, we're getting some withdrawal of enchantment out of the cosmos into specific entities here in polytheism, you know, the gods of the forests, the gods of the waters, um, etc. Um, which then gives way to uh, intrinsically given in one thing. And this is, of course, the um, Abrahamic religions mono theism, where all the enchantments is kind of removed from the, the world 
and and located and unified in one all powerful uh, place and entity, uh, you might say. Um, from there, it gets redistributed, extrinsically bestowed upon creation when the monotheistic creator creates uh, out of nothing uh, an expression of himself in creation. And, you know, within the Christian, Judeo Christian narrative, uh, it's also intrinsically, especially bestowed upon humans. They get more of a dose of enchantment than the animals and the plants and the rocks by virtue of bearing God's image. Well, this is all, you know, just very generalized as an overview. We're going to get back to this. Modernity arises and enchantment is theoretically revoked from everything. Although there's residual haunting of enchantment by the Raskajitans, Descartes' immaterial substance out of which individuations of cogito emerge, okay? Um, so the world that was once alive with enchantments is dead. But there are some entities that have the enchantment within. Those are humans. Well, late modernity, this is where we're headed. Enchantment becomes something programmable, can be programmed into everything. We have the technology, we have the key to enchantment. So we are going to be able to recover that world that's familiar, comfortable, um, and meaningful, and qualitatively captivating um, through our own means, through cyber enchanting uh, software. Okay, so that's an overview. Now, let me just go into one more delay with a sidebar on uh, the word enchantment or disenchantment. This of late has become very uh, uh, big discussion, tons of stuff written about enchantment, disenchantment, taking it, its you know, main source from, from Weber, but we have Bloomberg, Taylor, Critchley, uh, Bennett and Joseph and Storm. Um, all talking about, you know, were we ever really enchanted? Um, what is this enchantment? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, I'm not gonna get into any of that. I am just taking the word and using it for this. To say something is disenchanted, like the cosmos is um, that, Whatever there ultimately is, it has no intrinsic properties capable of sustaining normed distinctions, individuations. That reality in the raw is flat, one dimensional, and it has no um, principled, uh, distinctions or individuations inherently objectively. There's just aggregations of the same stuff, creating complex agglomerations through impersonal forces. There's nothing integral 
to what ultimately is that could be violated or, or could be um, uh, resisted. It's, it's all there for the taking and for the making. Okay, that's basically all I'm talking about when I talk about disenchantment. Well, now let's get into our journey here from robust enchantment first to enchantment light, the Judeo Christian difference. We already talked about the robust enchantment in the pre modern uh, uh, cosmos. Here, uh, we get a form of disenchantment, which, which leads to uh, remaining enchantment. I call it enchantment light um, in the Judeo Christian synthesis uh, that, that brings Greek Platonist uh, thinking and Stoic thinking uh, together in the early church in its attempts to evangelize uh, the surrounding Hellenistic culture. You know, big disenchantment as the monotheism, sucking all of the enchantment out of uh, the created order, which for the pre-modern, uh, the, the Greek thinkers, it was eternal. It was always there, okay? Uh, this enchantment. And here, uh, Hebraic outlook says, no, um, there is no enchantment out there. It's uh, no eternal intrinsic enchantment at all. And if, if you allow that to shape your views, you're um, committing adultery. Um, uh, not adultery, idolatry, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, and so, uh, you know, this is the world not enchanted, and you better recognize that because you're robbing the great enchanted one of uh, his due. Okay. Well, I say, you know, it's enchantment light in the midst of this enchantment because there is remains of enchantment within the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, cosmos. We have the Imago Dei in, in humans, which, um, you know, marks them as, as different, as somewhat a divinized um, inherently. And we also have natural revelation where the uh, cosmos that um, the uh, creator brought into being uh, still expresses his enchanted intentions. But the enchantment isn't in intrinsic and it isn't eternal as it was for the pre-modern um, Greek Hellenistic and, and Hellenic and, and even earlier outlooks, right? Well, a key figure uh, in this kind of enchantment light is um, Philo of Alexandria. And I'm not gonna say much about him, but what he really brought to the, the early Christian apologists um, was a way of bringing some of this uh, Greek enchantments into the Christian picture in a way that didn't uh, compromise the Christian picture so much. And it, it was a bridge for uh, those whose thinking was influenced by the Hellenistic thought to say, hey, you know, maybe uh, this Christianity has some real plausibility to it. Basically what uh, Philo of Alexandria suggested was that we take the forms, the eternal unchanging forms of, of Plato's metaphysics and plant those in God's mind. This um, 
basically bridges the, the Greek to, to the Judeo-Christian in a, a, a very uh, captivating way that, you know, Plato said that these exist in a timeless, spaceless, some place. Um, you know, you can't even really talk about the, 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 how these things exist. But uh, Alexander Philo is suggesting, well, hey, they have a, a place. Their e place is eternal and unchanging, um, just like the idea. And that is, um, just like the forms, that is God's ideas. That's where they really belong. Well, you know, we have Augustine who leans on this, develops it, Boethius um, picks up on, on these themes. And basically we end up with a, a view of creation as an externalization and a materialization of God's ideas. He brings them out of himself in material manifestation. That's what creation is. Creation participates in God's mind. It materially expresses God's mind. And, and so here's a, a, a kind of internal linkage to um, enchantment of of the world not just you know imposed from outside of it but this is a formal connection to the very essence of god and and so there's a recovery of uh, a thicker um enchantment with this melding of greek christian uh hebraic thinking god does not merely bring creation into existence, but also informs it with his own essence, such that creation itself expresses in time what from all eternity resided in God. Consequently, nature retains an intrinsically normative character. It's enhanced. Okay. That's from uh, Louis uh, Dupre, um, Passage to Modernity. Okay, so let's take a step further in time. Um, from organismic to mechanical metaphor um, for uh, worldview, root metaphor. The organismic uh, metaphor rooted in, in Plato, Aristotle, Neoplatonist, Stoics, adapted by the early church theologians held sway over most of the middle ages uh, there were deviations for sure but um it 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 shows up uh in in many places throughout the middle ages the reduction to mechanism from the organismic begins when the late medieval voluntarists and nominalists take their conceptual razors to the fabric of the participatory cosmos and cut away its imminent logos, that, that, that formal linkage to the exemplars of God's very mind. And this is uh, what, what leads to the, the collapse of the enchanted medieval synthesis, catalyzing what Lewis refers to as the great movement of internalization. That is the migration of the Logos enchantments into human subjectivity. But he says that consequent aggrandization of man and resultant desiccation of the outer universe, disenchantment. Well, we need to talk a little bit about how voluntarism and nominalism, given the role it plays in the movement to um, disenchanted mechanistic uh, outlook. 
what is theological voluntarism? A late medieval movement within the church to safeguard God's absolute sovereignty. Um, we get a sense of what the voluntarists were about um, from what's condemned in the uh, 1277 uh, condemnations, which seem to be directed primarily at Dominican intellectualism, um, which we will um, uh, explain a little bit in, in just a moment. But the big issue is, you know, it seems like uh, there's heresy here with this, this synthesis that, um, you know, uh, has, has been dominating, especially the Dominican thinking about God's relationship to the world. Uh, it seems like the world has a, too much um, autonomy, too much integrity that uh, it, it, it might actually get in the way of God's freedom if he is uh, limited by the forms he embodied out there. Um, and, and so we need to take a closer look at what's going on with this. Um, and basically what uh, voluntarism was out to accomplish was the denial of exemplars in God's mind. Because, you know, God has his will has to be expressed through the filter, um, through the sieve of his ideas. And that seems to keep God locked into um, a priori constraints that diminish his absolute sovereignty. Well, we'll talk about that more in just a moment. What is theological nominalism? Well, again, a late medieval movement within the church to safeguard God's knowledge of his creation's specificity and contingency. Um, the idea was God's relationship to his creation, if we keep these uh, forms of Plato in God's mind, and then creation is just matter draping these eternal forms from God's mind, <laughs> excuse me. Well, then God just knows the forms. Um, he doesn't know the, the you know, singularity of, of realities. And, and reality has a necessity to it that's rooted in the uh, eternal, unchanging ideas in God's mind. And, and so uh, there, there's no contingency within creation. It's a closed deductive system as a lot of medieval science um, traded on. And so uh, nominalism was, was trying to recover uh, a, a created world that was knowable beyond subsumption, uh, beyond taking uh, instances of it and subsuming it under some, some first principle. They were all about denying the forms of God's mind's embodiment in creation as universals. Um, universals are really just concepts or just names. And, and so, um, you know, they're not objective realities out there that we have um, to discern, they are crutches for our finitude, for organizing the, the um, similarities and the uh, diversities of all the particularities of a creation uh, filled with um, 
a kind of contingency, no longer shackled to the um, a priori of God, its eternal uh, exemplars. So both of these set the stage for creation contingentization, I just made that up, and wholesale disenchantment. And of course, this sets the stage for the rise of modern science. But let's say a few more things about theological um, volunteerism. It was something that was opposed to theological intellectualism, which is something that gets moved through history, becomes rationalism in the modern era. But um, let's get a sense of what this is about what voluntarism was reacting to, uh, sometimes referred to as the, the, the way of antiquity. Um, it was understood that theological intellectualism or the forms were um, uh, God's exemplars was really a, a compromise of divine sovereignty. God's eternal reason and intellect govern his actions according to intellectualism. When God created the cosmos, his will was expressed through the a priori grid of his intellect, eternally informed by exemplars. So his, his will was uh, subordinated to his ideas. He could only will through those ideas. And that seemed to the voluntarists to compromise God's ultimate powers. Within the framework of theological intellectualism, reason is the means by which humans can finitely and imperfectly know God and his actions. Reason connects us to universals. Universals connect us to God's mind. Right. Creation expresses natural law, wherein the cosmos is enchanted with divine rationality and meanings. Creation has structure, it has grain, and that grain is a function of the form of the universal, of the exemplar that originates in God's mind. The cosmos is a closed deductive necessitarian system of God's ideas in mattered, you know, uh, materialized, from which humans can logically deduce cosmic and empirical states of affairs. This is, you know, the basis of all the parodies of the um, medieval outlook and their, um, you know, being able to conclude that the earth, you know, had to be uh, the center of the universe, that the uh, celestial bodies had to be perfectly um, circular. Um, but they didn't even have to do any research or dig into the contingencies of creation. They could get there purely through reason, through thought. To the voluntarist, grounding enchantment in the metaphysics of exemplarism resulted in straitjacketing God's will, holding it captive to Plato's forms. And that was the heresy. God's very essence had been distributed too thickly into the metaphysical substructures of his creation, making creation the ontological heavyweight and leaving him divinely anemic, anorexic. Well, theological voluntarism says, look, God is absolutely sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. He's not beholden to ideas, in his mind, um, he can say one thing and do something else. 
uh, he can, you know, uh, act in one way and out of his pure sovereignty, governed by no logic of consistency of any sort, um, he can do something totally different tomorrow. Um, well, the intellectualists saw this as compromising God's consistency and creation's intelligibility because creation, uh, he, could, he could manipulate and, and change uh, how it behaved. You know, miracles are an exception, but within this framework, uh, you know, it, it's like you're, you're surprised to find any consistency um, if God is, is not beholden to, to any kind of constraint except his arbitrary uh, uh, will. The divine will in the uh, voluntarist framework is preeminent over the divine intellect. And of course, when you bring this all together, it, it feeds into a spring that gushes contingency into the worldview of modernity, leaving no more deductive routes to knowledge of facts about the world. And it lays a firm basis for the empirical and techno-interventionist practices of what would become modern science. And you know, many Christians celebrate this very thing that look, um, it's uh, Christianity, um, voluntarist in, intrusions into the scholastic outlook that, that gave us all the marvels of, of modern science um, undermines any firm basis for certainty about the future behavior of the world that modern science would go to great lengths to know and to control. Um, for some reason, there were consistencies in the world, um, but they're gratuitous, they're, they're contingent. They could change at any moment, but you know, for some reason, they're, they're not. Um, and you know, some of the voluntarists had ways of accounting for these consistencies in, in, in terms of distinctions of powers of God's will, but I'm not gonna dig into that. But it, the recovery of God's sovereign freedom within the enchanted universe of the nominalist also brought with it a corresponding elevation as it degrades the uh, material world into contingency and disenchantment. It upgrades human agency and its role in obtaining certainty about the world. Um, but it also brings anxiety because there wasn't that eternal framework to lean on to make sure that the center holds, right? So we now have the stage setting for a world machine where modern disenchantment becomes naturalized. Natural law loses its metaphysical warrant replaced by brute physical law. Humans will have to become the manufacturers of their own certainty through vigorous and rigorous investigatory methodology. Um, it wasn't something given the structures of uh, the world um, through through God's embodiment of his ideas, when we individuate and draw lines and uh, make distinctions, we are the agents of those distinctions. We're not merely recognizing God's eternal distinctions. So we get what I call productivist epistemology replacing the participatory epistemology of um, the pre-modern outlook. Rather than participating in a pre-individuated cosmos of embodied forms, which brought rational souls into cognitive identity with the realities they know, 
human knowledge would henceforth depend upon the production of representations internally in their enchanted sensorium that individuated agglomerations of particulate matter into humanly cognizable abstraction. If there were to be any rational structures in this emerging modern world, they would henceforth be the projections of human subjectivity, not material embodiments of God's exemplars. So we end up uh, are coming uh, through modernity with a world formatted for manipulation. 250 years after Occam's death, you know, the famous nominalist, we're talking about nominalism, Descartes was born, and Descartes would carry forward nominalist and voluntarist metaphysics to forge a mechanistic worldview that somehow preserved human freedom and agency. Descartes would attempt to explain everything in the material world, in the ref cogitans, the extended world, in terms of a very reduced ontology of space occupying materials pushed about by mechanically transmitted forces. That inert space occupying uh, bits being organized quite uh, non-rationally, non-personally by physical forces. All cosmic qualities, values dissolved into quantities and facts, laying the basis for modernity's famous fact value dichotomy. Fact is that bad stuff out there, value is the projection of this living perspective in here where all the enchantment has gone to hide as it were. Where has all the enchantment gone? A long time ago, uh, it's gone indoors to rest cogitants. This is Descartes' dualism. And uh, we're going to say a word about that. I see my time's running. I think I, I have about 15 minutes left total. And I should be able to get through this, uh, no problem. Pre-modern cosmos enchantments were perceived by the late medieval theologian metaphysics to threaten God's sovereign freedom. Eckhart and others like Bacon recognized that they also, that is those enchantments also got in the way of human freedom to bend the material world into conformity to and into service of human needs and desires. If the world had this objective enchanted integrity of the pre-modern outlook, then we could offend it by imposing our ends and violating the eternal ends rooted in God's mind. And, and so we had to be careful with how we dealt with the material world bearing its you know, enchanted linkage to God. But once that's shaved away, um, it just becomes, as, as Heidegger would put it, um, standing reserved, just waiting to be ordered by, by human desire with no intrinsic integrities to be violated. In the enchanted cosmos of pre-modernity, technologies were viewed as nature's help means. The tools that were used were means of bringing nature to her natural ends. They would come alongside nature to support her intrinsic telic tendencies. Like a, think of a sailboat, you know, it's waiting for the wind, but it's gonna deflect the uh, wind in such a way that it's going to carry the sailboat to its harbor where the humans want to uh, end up. But 
you got to wait on nature. Nature has its own integrities, and you learn to live with them. Within the disenchanted modern world, technologies change. They become now in this dead universe of matter and mechanical motion, technologies become the human means to master nature. Overcoming nature's native limitations by the external imposition of our subjective enchantment, our ends upon it. And of course, often in violent ways, just compare the sailboat to the motorboat. Who cares if there's wind? Um, we are going to force nature to uh, do our bidding. With the givens of the cosmos, cosmos is pre-established ideal order vanquished. Humans can now impose their own ideal order onto nature. And through their technological ingenuity, take it, master it, and remake it in the image of their own ends and their own desires. Well, Descartes was a dualist. He disenchants the material world, but all the enchantment goes indoors to human subjectivity. The cogito becomes the vessel into which Descartes funnels pre-modern enchantments. Getting his manipulable mechanical cake whilst enjoying the taste of human freedom too. Within the barren desert landscapes of the disenchanted world machine, the world transcending cogito was exquisitely poised to become, as Descartes framed it, master and possessor of nature. However, the ghosts in this world machine were soon to be exercised. Descartes' dualism collapses. The cogitos Disembodied ontology gave rise to what I call an angelic epistemology. Ideals the cogito itself could not meet, gave rise to an angelic epistemological ideals that the cogito itself could not meet. The cogito's first person perspective didn't show up clearly and distinctly in either second person or third person objectification and thus could not earn its ontological keep. Um, this is all part of, you know, the um, burden placed upon human subjectivity to secure certain knowledge once the cosmos is disenchanted. And so the rigorous criteria are set up for certainty through methodological uh, rigor. And, and yet the cogito itself, who is the deployer of that rigor, turns up not able to meet the criteria for that rigor. And so, Descartes' ghosts in the machine would be exercised and disintegrated. Within years of Descartes' death into third person matter in motion, joining the ranks of everything else in the world machine where everything is laying open to endless manipulation. The ghosts were exercised with dispatch but not without leaving behind the stage setting for the transhumanist project. Um, and I can't see what I have there because of uh, this um, uh, screen set up, uh, but you can read that for yourself. Let me move towards the conclusion here. The transhumanist project is deeply indebted to Descartes. Visions of rest extensive 
encompassing both machine and organism in a, a purely mechanical framework is one of the, the depths of transhumanism to Descartes. His attempt to unify life and the machine, all bodies, human, animals, were just mechanical contractions of res extensa. Only the human body machine had, uh, you know, the cogito in it. Um, Descartes' dream of humans becoming masters and possessors of nature through unlimited mechanical techno interventions, transhumanism takes up and carries forward. So Descartes cultivated the soil and planted the germinating seeds that have lately grown into transhumanist aspirations to subsume both machine and mind in a purely informational uh, ontology. This is really nothing more than a new iteration of Cartesian dualism, but in a sub-personal register, information rather than res cogitans. The body machine becomes the computational hardware of uh, the transhumanist project. The transcendent mind of the cogito becomes a virtual machine within the computational hardware of the body machine. Rejecting Descartes' substance dualism while covertly smuggling something very akin to it through the back door, transhumanism merely strips the cogito of its immaterial substance and re-outfits it in a diaphanous, finely woven pattern of information. Here's the long story short of transhumanist uh, attempts, our project for mind upload. Um, this could get very technical, so I've simplified things. I'm just going to read through it for those who can you know, fill in the blanks, wonderful. Um, we might do that afterwards here, but let me just move through this. Within this disenchanted cosmos, you know, Alan Turing showed that a physical machine could be designed that used its own physical magnitudes to drive its state transitions in conformity to the rule governed and formal discriminations of a syntactical code thereby bridging physics to formal syntax. That is physics, it's getting enchanted here. It, it, it's being governed by something that is beyond it, by norms of syntax. He provided a theoretical basis for interpreting the machine's physical magnitudes as an act of Boolean operations you know, the binary operations of and, or, and not. Operations that when deployed on semantically interpreted data structures, our ideas, our propositional content, could in principle be interpreted as simulating human reasoning, effectively bridging syntax now to semantics and by transitivity to physics. Um, cyberneticist uh, McCulloch and Pitt and their 90, uh, 43 article made the connection between the on-off firing of neurons and the digitality of logical functions, initiating the deeply influential conception of neuronal activity as instantiating a logical calculus a characterization of neural activity that would underwrite the view that the brain is essentially a Turing machine, extending the linkages of physics to syntax and syntax to semantics to a new bridging of mind and brain. The mind 
is therefore understood as a computational informational processor. These efforts to capture meaning in matter engendered what would in a few decades become functionalism in the philosophy of mind, the view of the brain as more like a digital computer than any other bodily organ, and of the computer as more like a brain than any other machine. The transhumanists believe that computational functionalism shows how the abstract informational architecture of the human mind can be prized apart from its aboriginal biological substructures, demonstrating that minds are both multiply realizable. They can be moved from the protein bodies into you know, silicon uh, systems and substrate mobile. Um, basically, that um, information patterns can uh, you know, be uploaded, downloaded um, uh, ad infinitum. So there's no essential linkage to mind and, and any particular form of, of matter. And this is the conceptual ground upon which mind upload feasibility rests. My conclusion. Enhance to re -enhance. With this meltdown of mind into abstract information, the transhumanists see opportunity to use our technological prowess to intelligently and intentionally enhance so as to re-enchant the informational patterns that make us who we are. Given the exponential rate of technological advancement and armed with the faith in an informational ontology of human minds and the resultant substrate mobility of human minds that such an ontology entails, we or our cyborgic melds will soon design and create self-editing, self-improving AIs that will then design and create more advanced AIs than themselves. This will put a re-enchanted world within reach. As popular uh, transhumanist Ray Kurzweil put it, the universe will be at our fingertips, giving us finally the opportunity to upload to the superintelligent AI's databases the information patterns instantiated in our software selves and therefrom live our enchanted dreams within the network cyberspace of those databases. Freed from the disenchanting laws of physics and endlessly uh, uh, I can't see what I had here. <laughs> Let me just move this. Oh, physics in an endlessly enchanted phantasmagory of cyber self-indulgence. A world unlimited uh, of unlimited enchantments um, of our own design. <laughs>